So here is the exercise. In the, this exercise, we're removing duplication, right? We've created uh, some test code and our test code has a bunch of duplication. And now we want to get rid of all of that duplication. So basically that involves introducing a base test class. All of our test automation will always have a base test class. And once you have a base test class, we'll add some, we'll add some cross browser testing capabilities and then we'll move on. So go ahead and do this exercise and then don't peek in uh, the exercises in the pages yet. We will, we will analyze those results once you are finished again, once you have had enough and you want to give up or you are finished and are ready to proceed. So I'll see you in a bit. All right, so take a, let's take a look at our exercises here. So you see, uh, we got now two tests. Remember, this is the one remaining from exercise two, part three. Here we have our checkout feature test. I hope you have something similar. Again, um, this class should have been the same, but, and then the implementation should have been pretty similar. I didn't expect you to use page objects yet, but um, this is also the duplication that we're cleaning up. You can see this test also has a setup method, right? Just like our login feature test. So this is the duplication that we're removing. Um, here we are doing, should be able to check out with items. So we've extracted all of this information here and we've put it all into page objects in here. Uh, so this is what it kind of looks like. Not super clean, but getting better, right? So you can see we're adding some implicit weight. We're using a login page. We're visiting with that login page. Uh, then we're logging in. We are doing some assertions and then we're adding adding a backpack to a cart and checking out. So let's take a look at this test actually to make sure it runs. You pull up Sauce Labs here as well. So your Sauce Labs here, you can see I got one session running. Let's go take a look at that test. So here's that test case executing, look at adding an item to a cart. And I was going through the checkout process. So this should have been a little bit more difficult for you. It's nice because you have all the locators there and all the logic there already, but writing the page objects um, should have been the more difficult part. So let's take a look at our page objects here for this part. So here now we got a bunch of page objects, right? To interact with all of this. I want to show you these page objects. It's really important we talk about this because still years into test automation. In 2004, Selenium was created right around then. Page object pattern was created. The page object pattern continues to live on 15 years later. It continues to be the standard for test automation. For some reason, we keep trying to reinvent the wheel. We keep trying to go in some different direction and create something that doesn't need to be created. We try to make it either more, most of the time it's just more complicated than it needs to be. And we don't follow the rules of the page object pattern. And I would like for all of us to fix that. This is majority of the time, probably I would say at least 80% of the time I see all of us overcomplicating the page objects and not really listening to the advice that has been given us to us for 15 years. I myself have actually done it as well. I over engineered the page objects. We should just keep it simple and uh, follow the pattern. So this is what the good page object pattern looks like. It's really simple to apply. It's really great when you get it perfect and your automation is running perfectly. At that point, you might want to optimize, but for majority of us, it almost never needs to happen. There might be a few cases in the world where you will ever need to optimize on the page object pattern. And if you ever get to that point, come and contact me. We can talk about it and see whether you really need to do that or not. But in the meantime, let's talk about the right page object pattern. So the page object pattern, the whole idea behind it is just, it's an abstraction of your HTML page into a class. So here, for example, if I show you this page called the checkout complete page, are you based on the name of this class? Are you able to determine what this page is, what it does without, you haven't really seen our, the application, right? You haven't really played with the application, but are you able to see what this page does? 
well, yes, this page is is a checkout complete page, right? So it probably has something to do with the checkout process and making sure that the checkout was completed, was successful. Makes sense, right? I hope I hope we're on the same, way, same wavelength. Now, all of our page objects, unless you're using a programming language like JavaScript, will have a driver that is passed around. That is that. Don't get any more complicated than that pass around the driver. Keep it simple, stupid. That's it. You ain't going to need it. Let's keep it simple. Just pass around the driver. I've messed this up before as well. Made this so complicated, totally unnecessary. Just pass around the driver, set the driver in the constructor, good to go. Next, it has a method. This method performs operations that look like end user operations. So for example, when a user opens up a page, they want to make sure that that page is loaded. When a user wants to log in, for example, let's take a look at the login page. When a user wants to log in, then they have a login method. So in here, you can see that this user is able to perform these kinds of operations uh, and the login operation or the visit operation, right? These are what users are doing to this login page. They're opening it up and they're logging in. And the other piece of a page object are the locators. In this case, they are not stored in the proper place. We're going to clean the sub. They should be stored in properties if they want to be reusable. Now, if they're only used in here for now, we don't need to extract it out, right? Because they live in a single place. They're only used in one place here. They're fine here. But at some point, you're probably going to be reusing these locators, at which point you can move them into properties rather than uh, variables inside of the actual method. But that's a minor detail. So those are the components of a really good page object. It has a good name that identifies exactly what this page is. What is the login page? Well, it's this page, saucedemo.com. And if we open it up, Look, can, does, does the name of the class reflect what this page is? Yes, it does. Okay. What can the user perform with these operations? They can open. Also, you can call it visit the page and they can log in, right? That's it. The user can't do anything else. That's another thing I want to make sure users can't, for example, open a connection to a database. They can't open up SQL or they can't read something from Excel or they can't convert a string into array. The really what a user does with this page is open it up and log in. That's it. Um, so your page object should not be doing operations and should not be allowing operations like opening up to SQL or converting strings to arrays or reading from Excel's reading PDFs. Uh, that should not be possible in an automated test. Your page object can use that stuff to help them, but your test should never be able to perform those operations through a publicly exposed method in a page object. Um, and then, yeah, we got the locators, we got the methods. And oh, and one other thing that I wanted to mention is that page objects don't necessarily have to be an entire page. Let's go back to our application here. Let's take a look at the Sauce Labs website for, for a second. The Sauce Labs website here has a header. This header is persistent, right? Look, if I go to the dashboard page, the header is there. If I go to live testing, the header is there. If I go tunnels, the header is there. So the header is there for all of the pages. Very common. The footers, sidebars as well. Other elements could be part of every page. In that case, what we can do is we can put this entire header into its own page object, but we would call it a component, right? We would call it a component. We could call it a module. We can call it the header module. We can call it header component. And so then that will wrap all the operations and properties of this header. And then we can use it in all of our classes composition. We can use this uh, inside all of our classes rather than duplicating all of this in all of our page objects. Makes sense. You'll see that actually as we go through our tests. Uh, but I definitely wanted to mention that. So take a look at all of these tests and classes. You'll see there's a lot of similarity here. Um, the, they starting to look alike. So we'll want to remove all of that duplication, always trying to remove duplication without 
making our stuff too dry. Uh, but one other piece we left behind here is actually making sure that we remove duplication from our tests as well. The duplication removal from our tests will be in the next branch. So I hope you got pretty close to this. You know, it doesn't have to be exact, just I hope you were able to remove some duplication and clean it up and get these page objects after all the exercises we've done. Um, and if you haven't, go ahead, finish that up. And now we're gonna go to the next branch and see that solution. Uh, so I checked out this fourth branch, configuring atomic tests. And this is what you should end up with at the end after you finish doing exercise three. This is what you should end up with with the, this is the code that you should end up with. So remember how our tests were all pretty dirty. Uh, they were all had all this setup and tear down logic that we were doing before and after every test. So for example, in the checkout feature test, we had that in the login feature test, we had all that logic as well. And so now we've actually removed it. So ultimately the whole idea here is that although I'm taking you step by step, all throughout all our test automation, we're always thinking where is their duplication and how can I remove it without getting too dry? You don't wanna overdo it. You wanna make sure that your tests are still readable, but you do wanna remove all the duplication that's not necessary to make your tests readable. So follow my examples here. So with all of this, we've introduced a base test. Pretty much all standard UI test automation, meaning if you're working with any web apps or mobile apps, we'll have a base test class that will host pretty much this exact information where you have a before method that will create your driver and allow you to use it for your test automation. And you'll have an after method that will destroy the driver and clean up any other resources that you need cleaned up. As far as I can say right now, of course, there are always exceptions to rules in IT. Almost nothing is black and white, but for majority of the time, 99.9% .9 of automation that I've seen and that I've worked with must have a base test class. It must have a add before method, a before hook that does the setup of your driver, and it must have an after hook that does a teardown of your driver. There's almost never an excuse. If you think you have an excuse, come and talk to me. We'll figure out if that's your situation. But like I said, so far, at least in my life, I've never seen the case where that's needed to happen, where you should not have a base test class that does a before and tear down it's standard. So you should have it as well. And this base test class, all it does is, like I said, it does the setup, which will instantiate our driver. So we just moved all that dirty code that we used to have into here. And then at the end, it just destroys the driver. If you're using Sauce Labs, then it's really important that you set a, a passed or failed status to Sauce Labs. That's a very critical. So then Sauce Labs can know whether your test passed or failed, and then you can analyze it. It's easier to filter. It's easier to look at the test analytics. And then of course you should always, always, always be quitting the driver so that it kills your session. This is whether you have Sauce Labs or not, you should be doing this regardless. And so that leaves our very clean tests that look like this, right? They're not perfect yet. We still got a lot of work to do, but we've removed a lot of duplication from them that makes them way better. And now we can actually go ahead and run them and see how they look. So I'm gonna go ahead and run these tests. Let's pull up a new browser here. So you can see the test running on the left. And then here you can see we've got this test running and uh, should be able to check out with items. Started less than a minute ago. If we wanna come in here, we can watch this video, which of course is the fun part, seeing these tests run. It's cool that we made this kind of things work with our code, right? That we're able to create such interactions with the browser. And you can see how fast this test is, how fast it executes this is how all of our tests should be. They should be extremely fast um, and provide us really quick feedback so that we can we have a really good feedback loop in terms of the quality of our automation. So that was that one test. And then we can go back. And here's that other test that so see, I started a minute ago. So those are the tests. And then that's how they should pretty much look. Uh, I think you should not have really much deviation from this in your test automation code because all we really did is just move it to a 
uh, parent class. And then the other thing that we wanted to see was we said we're going to do cross browser testing here. So before we were testing on iOS and now here we did uh, with Chrome. So I actually cleaned up the code a little bit because now with W3C, we are starting to do something like Chrome options. So here you can see that we are using Chrome. And so in this case, we're using Chrome options running on Windows 10 and the latest browser version. And so that when we go back and I unfortunately close that window. So here you can see that our test ran on Chrome 76, Windows 10. So they did run cross browser while before they were just running on Safari. So we are able to easily switch our tests to run between iOS and Safari.